So let's start. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the set, uh, second meeting of EOP Innovation and Insight Scientific Meeting organized by the AI EOP Prediction, AI for EOP Prediction Study Group at GIGOS, uh, where I and uh, Justina and Santiago um, uh, chairing uh, this study group and the main aim of this uh, meeting is to bring together um, researchers and scientists to discuss the latest achievements in EOP prediction with special focus on application of machine learning. Our first meeting was on uh, June uh, 6, it was almost uh, a month ago, where we had uh, Yunyan Liu from uh, ETH Zurich, and he uh, shared his insight on recurrent neural network and their application for EOP prediction, providing an overview of how this advanced neural network can improve EOP prediction. And today, uh, we are happy to have our speaker, Mustafa Kiani, uh, from Institute of Geodesy and Photogrammetry at ETH Zurich. And uh, Mustafa today will present on explaining the cause of polar motion by physics neural network, net, uh, neural network and he, um, he show his latest achievement in understanding the process underlying polar motion for advanced machine learning technique and highlighting the result which is recently published in the um, Nature Geoscience Journal. And before we start, uh, let me to give you all a brief scientific uh, biography of Mustafa Kiani in order to, um, I mean, everyone uh, um, uh, know him. Uh, he received his bachelor and uh, master of science in geodesy from University of Tehran in Iran, and since 2000, he has been a PhD student in the space show that he group at ETH um, with a group of Medic Soya, and his work focuses on machine learning for time series analysis and prediction, particularly uh, related to the GNSS station position and EOP. One of his main interests is in cooperating uh, physical inform into machine learning using uh, physics uh, inform neural network, which called um, PINT. He made several contribution to analyze and prediction of EOP using PINs, including um, investing the cause of long uh, period polar motion, UT1, and notation. Okay, um, first I also want to thank you all for joining us for uh, this meeting for today. And um, before uh, the uh, meeting, I, I also wanted to mention that I asked most of all to prefer some slide explaining the methodology itself uh, in order to um, um, be also more clear for everyone and then uh, showing the application of this uh, method. Uh, so uh, what we expected from uh, this meeting, it would be also like a university lecture um, and it also takes uh, almost uh, one hour. And um, I think um, that it would be, um, I, I, I think that it would also really informative and um, thank you again and uh, I want to ask Mustafa if he can um, 
page on his video and also. Is this, um, is this, this final form? This final directory is? Okay. Can see you and. Yeah. Can you see my slides? Uh, yes. And if it's possible to uh, make it in the presentation. Okay. 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 Yeah, uh, stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Sadr, for this introduction. And in this presentation, I will talk about the causes of polar motion, and I explain them by physics-informed neural networks. So, in terms of table of contents, first I will uh, give an introduction to neural networks because Sadr asked me um, to give some basic knowledge on neural networks, and then. I move to physics-informed neural networks, some basic background on um, this. And then I will talk about the long period polar motion, both in terms of observations and geophysical influences. And then I present the results and the discussions, and finally the concluding remarks. So, the first part is the introduction to neural networks. This is a very basic introduction and I hope it is useful. So, first some preliminaries. Uh, in order to define neural networks, we need to know the concept of... Um, we need to know the concept of parametric model. So, a parametric model is a mathematical function that has three adjustable parameters. So if we denote the model as f, then uh, the independent input is uh, denoted by t. I have shown it uh, by t because usually in our problems it denotes time. And then we also have some parameters denoted by w. And this can be determined based on some observational series. And that's why we call them adjustable parameters. The second concept is the concept of non-parametric model, which is basically opposed to parametric model. It is a mathematical function that does not have three parameters. It's just a function that gets an input and maps an output, like a, a sine or cosine uh, function that just takes an input and gives an output. So, in terms of definition, neural networks are defined as parametric models that are consisted of a composition of several submodels. And each of these submodels involves a non-parametric model. I have put none in the parentheses because sometimes uh, this functions that I mentioned can have some parameters that can be adjusted. But mostly, in our case, they are non-parametric. I have put this just to keep this in mind. So, the general form of neural networks can be defined as um, this composite function. So, basically, we have a basic function like f1, then uh, a non-parametric function acts on it, then in the second function acts on the input of this, and so forth. It goes to L functions. If you have uh, L functions, the composite function can be represented as this. And these non-parametric uh, functions, I have shown them by sigma, and these are called activation functions. And depending on how many functions we can reuse, uh, this we say we have L number of layers. So if we have L functions, we have L layers. These functions fk from k to L, these are called the functions in the case layer. And before moving forward, I would like to mention that the usual activation functions that we use are uh, tangent hyperbolic, which is defined as um, this exponential relation. And 
also the identity activation function, which uh, maps the input. Uh, the output is basically the input. Input and output are the same. And then the general form of the neural networks, uh, the uh, general form of the functions in a neural network based on the input x can be represented as a multiplication of a matrix with three dimension hk and this uh, three dimension is called hidden dimension or number of neurons um, in the case layer and then another term another constant is added to it and this constant is called bias so basically the form of the fak function the function in the case layer can be represented as a simple linear transformation and the weights or wk are the uh, are consisting of both the uk and also bk and of course uk is itself um, a matrix with uh, real values that has the dimension hk uh, times dimension of uh, x usually in um, neural networks terminology they use the notation of for example uk transpose dot x but for simplification here i'm just showing uh, the usual matrix multiplication and I have also shown the input as X because uh, in the definition of neural networks, I showed as T, but here I'm showing as X because the X can be the output of the previous layer, which is not necessarily the input of the first layer. That's all. So the concept of architecture refers to the form of the neural network, and we mainly focus on the multi-layer perceptrons and with tangent hyperbolic activation functions. Why do we use MLPs? Because MLPs are both accurate and define a continuous function. For, um, in order to apply pins or physics informed neural networks, we usually need to have a continuous functions because usually pins are defined based on um, differential equations. And in order to differentiate a function, the function should be continuous. And MLPs present a continuous function, and that's one of the most important reasons that we focus on MLPs. And why do we use uh, tangent hyperbolic activation functions? Because uh, we also use, um, tested other activation functions, such as rectified linear unit, but it turns out that in our problem, uh, tangent hyperbolic activation function can present the most accurate results. And opposed to rectified linear units, we, uh, we can cover both negative and positive values with tangent hyperbolic activa activation function. And this is another important characteristic of tangent hyperbolic activation functions. So the general form of the uh, MLPs can be represented as this. So the first function is a simple linear transformation uh, such as ut, u1 times t plus v1. Then the other functions are uh, the same as f1, but the input is the output of the previous layer. So for example, the function in the case layer is the multiplication of a matrix with the output of the previous layer plus the bias and uh, the activation functions from layer one to uh, the final layer the layer before the final layer uh, are all tangent hyperbolic activation functions and the final layer has the identity activation function uh, we are using identity activation function because um, they can map to an arbitrary range of values. Tangent hyperbolic is just between minus one and one, and it does not cover uh, the whole uh, range of uh, real values. But with linear, but uh, with identity activation function, we can map 
to the whole range of real numbers. And then how we derive the uh, adjustable parameters of a neural network. And this is based on optimization, based on a set of um, data. Uh, the input is T and the output is Y. We have uh, N number of observations. And this, uh, this process is called supervised learning. Mostly in this presentation, uh, we focus on uh, supervised learning. And this is done through an optimization objective, which is called loss function. And through the algorithms such as stochastic gradient descent, Adam optimizer, LBFGS. We mainly focus on LBFGS because uh, in order to optimize the network, we need to compute the gradient. But LBFGS computes the Hessian matrix in addition to the gradient. And this is this causes uh, the net the optimization algorithm to be more accurate. And what we do is to first try to derive these adjustable parameters in the so-called training phase. And then we use this trained model to make predictions. And the predictions can be compared with the observations. Uh, we, we can also have some hyperparameters, such as the hidden dimension, because we can vary how many uh, hidden neurons we have in uh, architecture, and these are called hyperparameters. So, very generally, we can say the predicted model, y uh, i hat, is equivalent to the output of the model at the input t i, and then this is compared with the observation and the last function compares the observation with the predictions this should be minimized the usual loss function that we use is based on mean square error which is defined as the mean of the squared differences between observed and uh, predicted values so this was a very basic introduction to uh, neural networks and now a short introduction to physics in four neural networks. So neural networks uh, have some drawbacks. Mainly they are black box uh, solvers, which means that there is no guarantee that the solution is physically meaningful. So the it would be hard to interpret the results. A potential solution to this is to add the prior physical knowledge that we have uh, to the algorithm, and uh, this is called physics-informed neural networks. And uh, when I say pins, I mean physics-informed neural networks throughout this presentation. So pins basically constrain neural networks uh, to obey physical laws. So how do we achieve this? Uh, pins try to modify the loss function of the usual neural networks to incorporate the physical constraints. And this is achieved through an operator uh, denoted by L. L usually has a differential form. It can be either linear or nonlinear. If L is linear, usually we can even solve the problem using uh, um, traditional methods. But if it's nonlinear, usually it's not possible. But with pins, we can even solve nonlinear um, uh, differential problems. And this is a huge advantage of uh, pins. So we have our model. The output of the model or the predicted value is y hat is defined as the uh, output of the model and we also have some physical knowledge in terms of a differential operator or in more general uh, an operator that acts on the predicted value and it should be zero if it is not zero we 
move uh, the right hand side to the left it's no problem um, and then the last function of the pins is defined as the <clears throat> last function of the usual neural networks plus the last function of this operator so let me give you an example of uh, how this is achieved the example that i'm going to represent is a very simple example it's basically a toy example so we want to model an oscillator and then compare the predictions of the normal, normal neural networks and pins so we have a common training period and the predictions are then compared with the so exact solution to see how well we can predict so the example is uh, as follows so let's say we have a mass that's attached to a spring and then it is released at a certain time and then this mass oscillates so if we show the distance between this mass to this constant uh, to this fixed uh, point then it represents uh, this uh, oscillatory behavior and we know from the physics that uh, the operator that represents this oscillation is defined as this uh, the mass of the object uh, multiplied with the second time derivative plus the friction the coefficient of friction times the first derivative plus the spring constant and this defines how uh, stiff the spring is so if this operator acts on the um, predicted value then we have this differential equation we can simply solve this based on uh, yeah simple traditional approaches and derive the exact solution based on initial value then what we do also is to um, insert this physical knowledge to usual neural networks to define pins uh, yeah as I, as I mentioned we optimize using uh, LBFGS algorithm so the last function is defined as follows we have the usual mean squared error uh, loss function then we also add this uh, differential equation um, directly to the loss function this should be as, as small as possible because yeah this is a homogeneous differential equation and then we minimize this and by minimizing this we are ensuring that we are satisfying the physical law as well as fitting to the observations so let me give you uh, some results on this so basically if we apply normal neural networks this orange dot uh, represents some training data uh, which are used to uh, derive the adjustable parameters of the neural networks and then in this range we try to predict this blue line shows the uh, predictions of the neural networks and this exact solution is derived by solving the differential equation using traditional method so we see if we apply normal neural networks they do not predict well basically the prediction is not following the exact solution at all and it doesn't matter how many training steps we use but if we apply physics informed neural networks uh, we see that we basically fit to the data as well as predict the exact solution if you see we have more training step it's because this example is uh, uh, taken from ben mosley and in his code he used a lot of training steps but it doesn't matter we can define uh, the same number of training steps for both of these but still the pins would work better so we see that uh, pins work much better however this is a very simple example in which we know the exact solution and also 
we have perfect data. But in reality, we neither have perfect data nor perfect models. In this case, pin, pins can also be useful because they can cover the deficiencies in the modeling part. If there are some physics that are not uh, incorporated into the model, still the physics in formula networks can cover those parts. And it's even possible to derive the missing, the so-called missing physics. And this is achieved through equation discovery. Um, also, they can quantify the uncertainty of the predictions in order to uh, see how well we can reconstruct the uh, signal. And we usually do this through uncertainty quantification through ensembling approaches. We define different models with different initial conditions and then average over uh, those models. It's even possible we have multi-physics pins. The example I showed you was just a simple oscillator uh, that only followed a simple differential equation. We, uh, with multi-physics pins, we can have uh, several physical systems that are contributing to a phenomenon. And in order to model all of those, we try to define different neural networks to model each physical system. Then all of these neural networks in general define a dynamic system uh, denoted by D uh, of Q neural networks. And I'm showing the neural networks uh, by M1 to MQ uh, in order to be more clear. Uh, yeah, so we have a dynamic system of Q neural networks, each with uh, usually the same architecture, but with different um, uh, parameters. And this dynamic system can be used in a very important um, procedure called perturbation approach. Um, I'm mentioning this because later I will discuss the uh, influence of uh, different geophysical processes on each other. And this is achieved through perturbation approach. Um, in perturbation approach, we analyze the influence of variation of a neural network on others. And this is this finds the causality and correlation between physical parts that are involved in a, a, a dynamic system. So what we do is to perturb the parameters of a neural network and then analyze the influence of this perturbation on the other neural networks. So if we perturb model number K, then other parameters are perturbed as well in response uh, to this perturbation because we have a dynamic system. And then since the parameters change, uh, we can uh, derive the influence of uh, one uh, physical, uh, physics part on the other physical part. It can also be non-isotropic, which means that uh, the effect of physical model one to two, for example, is not necessarily the same as uh, uh, model number two to one. So basically, for example, if we perturb the parameters of the model one, then if we insert this perturbation to the dynamic system, other parameters are changed, and then we, we can uh, derive the perturbation due to the uh, perturbation in the other neural networks. This was a very simple example. Uh, this was simple, uh, sorry, simple uh, explanation or simple introduction to physics in four neural networks. And now I move to uh, the application, uh, which is based on long period polar motion. Uh, I will present some discussion of the observations and also geophysical influences. So what do I mean by long period polar motion? Uh, by long period polar motion, I mean the periods that are much longer than the Chandler wall. 
In order to be on the safe side, I try to remove all the uh, periods that are shorter than 500 days. So it, the polar motion observations since 1900 up to the end of 2018, here 2019 means end of 2018. Um, and the observations are with respect to the mean of 2002 to 2018. This is because I want to be consistent with um, the data of other geophysical processes that are with respect to 2002-2018. So the polar motion observations feature different signals. So we have obviously this um, maybe quasi periodic signals, and this involve uh, Chandler wobble as well as annual wobble. We also have a secular trend, mostly seen in the YP component. By the way, the polar motion, as you know, has two components. XP is along the um, zero degree uh, Greenwich median, and YP is along the 90 degrees west longitude. We mostly see this in the uh, YP component. And if I uh, show the pseudo spectral density of this time series uh, for both XP and YP, we see that the signal is, of course, dominated by Chandler wobble and annual wobble. And all the periods that are longer than 500 days are the focus of our study. So we try to remove these parts. Um, we remove uh, the periods shorter than 500 days by applying a low pass filter. And we derived a line period polar motion shown in this figure. This line period polar motion uh, actually involves interannual and longer period fluctuations, uh, as well as a secular trend. So basically, we have a secular trend that's caused by um, geophysical processes uh, acting on geological time scales, and we also have quasi-decadal variations. Um, yeah, these are caused by uh, processes that act on decadal or multi-decadal time scales. If I show the polar view, uh, I'm showing the polar view with respect to 1900 in order to be more, more clear. We see that since 1900, the position of the pole uh, has displayed uh, fluctuations as well as uh, a secular trend. So basically, pole is moving toward um, a certain longitude uh, west, and it also displays quasi-decadal uh, variations. So our study is focused on explaining this signal. Any signal that's uh, longer than uh, Chandler wobble. So our goal is to analyze the causes of a long period polar motion in a unified framework. And we consider all the uh, possible um, geophysical influences as well as their possible interactions. So the algorithm of analysis of long period polar motion can be summarized in this figure. So the polar motion itself is learned by two neural networks, M1 and M2. M1 is for XP, M2 is for YP. Then we have four different categories of uh, geophysical processes. The first one is barystatic processes, which refers to the mass variation in Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, or basically polar ice sheets, as well as uh, global glaciers and terrestrial water storage. So the polar motion itself also appears here because observations should be connected to the polar static observations. Uh, so we define two additional neural networks, M3 and M4, to learn the excitations due to barystatic processes. Then we also have glacial isostatic adjustment, or GIA, 
as well as mantle convection processes. So this refers to the very uh, long period or maybe uh, processes that act on geological time scales. GI is related to the um, the glaciation history because during the last ice age uh, we had large ices over northern hemisphere and they exerted a lot of force and since they disappeared the ground is re rebounding and this causes the mantle materials uh, to move uh, uh, toward the uh, northern hemisphere in the mantle and uh, we would have some uh, effect on geological time scale, mostly in terms of a secular trend coming from this. We also have mantle convection because of the uh, convection cells in the mantle. Mantle materials uh, th that are also connected to um, plate tectonics and continental drift. They represent, they are represented by four different neural networks, M5, M6, M7, and M8. These first two learn the uh, glaciation history, and these two learn the um, effect due to the uh, forcing elements of the mantle convection. We also have the core dynamics processes because um, the fluid outer core and also solid inner core at these boundaries, called uh, core mantle boundaries and inner core boundaries, um, torques and pressures uh, would uh, be generated that would be transferred to the mantle and this would cause polar motions of a few millisecond, milli arc second. We also have a tilt of the inner core because if the inner core is tilted, gravitational forces are generated that want to uh, align this um, tilted inner core with respect to mantle and this would cause perturbation to the inertial tensor of the Earth, therefore polar motion. These are represented by six neural networks, M9, M10, and to M14. Two of them learn the torque at CMB, two of them learn torque at ICB, and two learn the components of the equatorial components of the tilt of the inner core. We also have these seismic processes because uh, when earthquakes happen we have sudden mass redistribution this would cause some uh, step functions in the excitation domain and some kink in the uh, polar motion observations but these are not the only thing that uh, happen this is basically called co-seismic during which is during an earthquake but after an earthquake or between two earthquakes, we have the inter-seismic inter uh, period. And this would mostly act ag against the uh, post-seismic uh, effects. And therefore, we have a residual uh, effect coming from co-seismic, inter-seismic uh, cycles of earthquake. Then we base all the neural networks on the multi-layer perceptrons as i mentioned six layers 32 hidden neurons in each and we also apply 100 ensemble models in order to quantify the uncertainties so we have 16 different neural networks we have a lot of uh, differential equations that connect these two and uh, these uh, geophysical processes then we train and then uh, predict and we also quantify the uncertainties for the predictions so as with the methodology because we are applying pins we have the usual loss function one from uh, xp component of polar motion the other one from yp of polar motion and then we have four different uh, categories of loss function due to body study processes gia and mc mc means mantle convection and uh, core dynamics and seismic and then we optimize the whole thing based on LBFGS algorithm. But how do we achieve this? We try to predict polar motion based on physical knowledge and compare with the observation. The training period is from 1976 up to the end of 2018, and the prediction period is from 1900 to 1975. 
basically in this period we have more accurate observations so we try to fit the model in this period and then predict in this interval so the first part uh, some discussion on the geophysical inferences the body static processes this refers to the effect of mass variation in polarized shears, yellow volcanic shears, and terrestrial water storage, which cause gravitational, deformational, and rotational changes. Also, the water that results from melting of polarized shears and yellow volcanic shears um, is inserted into the ocean, and this would cause variations in the sea level. And in order to have a self consistent a methodology to derive the, uh, the gravitational, rotational, and deformational changes, we apply the so called sea level equation. And then uh, these excitations that are derived from the sea level equation are converted to the polar motion using basically the uh, Liouville equation. Uh, in order to define the Liouville equation, we define it in the uh, complex domain. So we have the imaginary unit, a square root of minus one, the P, which is the XP minus IYP. Minus is because it's a left-hand sided coordinate system. And we have the excitation, uh, which is defined as the first equatorial component of the excitation plus the I, uh, um, second component of the excitation. We have the uh, uh, complex valued frequency of the Chandler bubble, which is defined based on the period of the Chandler bubble as well as the quality factor of the Chandler bubble. We also have some uh, love numbers, namely the secular love number, Ks, tidal love number, K2, and load love number, K2 prime. So the general form of the uh, Liouville equation is defined as P plus um, I divided by uh, frequency of the channel bubble multiplied with the first derivative of the p is equivalent to this constant multiplied with the excitation. We can uh, separate the imaginary and real part of this equation in order to derive two coupled uh, differential equations that connect the excitation to the components of the uh, polar motion, xp and yp. Uh, and this is a coupled system because we, in both equations, we see the differentiation with respect to xp and also yp. But the coupled, uh, the coupling constant is small, um, around 0 0.2, and the the other constant defined as q is much larger. And this means that the variations in um, xp component of polar motion is more related to the second component of the excitation and the variations in yp of com yp component of polar motion is more related to the first component and this is the, uh, basically the opposite um, but how do we uh, compute these excitation functions so we compute this based on patterns of mass variations since 1900 taken from the paper of frederick's uh, et al 2020 this was given to me by one of my co-authors, Surendra at Hikari, at JPL, and I computed um, the barostatic processes, the effect of barostatic processes based on this. And then we defined two neural networks, uh, M1 for XP and M2 for YP, and also two neural networks to learn the excitation functions, M3 for chi1 and M4 for chi2. Then the last function of uh, for XCP is simply the MSE for predicted and modeled value, uh, modeled value and offset value, and then uh, also for YP the same, uh, the MSE of um, observed and predicted value or modeled value. Then the barostatic loss function is defined as um, the MSE. Uh, due to learning the first component of the excitation, MSE due to learning the second component of the excitation, and then these two terms come from directly inserting the uh, Liouville equation uh, 
to the uh, neural networks because here is just enough to transfer this to the uh, left hand side so that the right hand side is zero and then we have uh, right hand side is zero therefore this should be minimized the second uh, geophysical influence is uh, GIA mantle convection and this is due to the viscoelastic response of the cellulose. Um, based on the ice thickness variation since the last glacial maximum from the ice uh, 7, 7 GNA dataset plus the convection rates in the mantle, we can compute a GIA mantle convection effect. Uh, the formulation is based on Nakada 2008 and 2013. It's basically GIA on a convective mantle considering uh, continental drift. Here, uh, in order to be consistent with the papers, uh, I'm showing XP and YP by uh, M1 and M2. Basically, in long period promotion, they are equivalent. But in shorter periods, they might not be. But in our case, it's fine. So if we have uh, the Earth, during the last glacial period, there were large ice sheets in the northern hemisphere in a region called uh, Hudson Bay. Basically, there were large ices such as Laurentide ice sheet, and they have now disappeared. So the ground is rebounding. Based on the conservation of angular momentum, the rotation axis is moving toward this region. But this is not the only uh, thing that contributes to the secular trend in the polar motion. We also have the yeah, mantle convection. And as it turns out, uh, the processes that happen inside the Earth, namely the core dynamics, also contribute to a small secular trend in polar motion. Yeah, just uh, how we derive this. So basically, we have the Euler equation of motion and then we write it in terms of the components of the angular momentum. Then the angular momentum itself is defined as the uh, multiplication of this moment of inertia and the rotation vector of the Earth. Rotation vector of uh, the Earth, namely the perturbations in the rotation of the Earth, uh, is defined as this constant uh, or the mean rotation of the Earth multiplied with m1 and m2 basic polar motion and 1 plus m3. m3 is related to length of the, which I don't discuss here. And j itself, the moment of inertia, is defined as this relation taken from Monk and MacDonald, 1960. Um, basically, it involves um, a, a constant value for the inertia tensor plus the time-dependent second-degree tidal love numbers and the components of the uh yeah the components of the rotation vector and these are convolved with each other because uh, as we are discussing the viscoelastic response we need to uh, apply the concept of convolution it also involves another term denoted by eij and this is where the uh, mantle convection and glacial isoesthetic adjustment appear we have uh, decomposition of EIJ to D and P. D is related to mantle convection and P is related to uh, the effect of load. P itself uh, can be represented as the convolution of the delta function plus second degree time dependent love, uh, load love numbers and the moment of inertia or the change or the perturbations in the moment of inertia during uh, due to the uh, load of ice and uh, for the purpose of this presentation i present the equations uh, in the time domain but a better approach would be to transform the equation in the laplace domain so basically we have these two relations that connect m1 and m2 which are the components of polar motion uh, two components of the mantle convection. This uh, D3, 3 star, D1, 1 star, D2, 2 star, and D1, 2 star are components of the 
uh, mantle convolution. These are constant because they change over uh, 500 million years. So in our case, they can be safely considered as constant. But we also have uh, some other terms, D1, 3 star and D2, 3 star. And these are the so-called forcing elements of the mantle convection. And this can be derived based on subduction history and bad backward advecting um, density anomalies in the mantle. I will come back to this later. So the other terms are uh, defined. Maybe this Kf is the, again, the secular or the fluid nerve number, and sigma CR is uh, Chandler bubble for the rigid earth. So two neural networks uh, try to learn the changes in the inertia tensor due to load of ice, namely M5 lens delta L13 and M6 lens delta L23. And two neural networks try to learn the forcing elements of the mantle convection, namely M7 lens D13 star and M8 D23 star. And the loss function of J and MC can be again represented as uh, four terms. One term, these two terms are actually related to mean squared error of the modeled and observed values of changes in the inertial tensor due to the load of ice. And these are two relations that connect uh, mantle convection and J to polar motion. The third part is the core processes. Uh, these are represented as torque and pressure at CMB and ICB. So torque can be in terms of electromagnetic, topographic, viscous, or gravitational. We also have the tilt of the inner core, which is represented by NS, and it has component XS and YS. Before I represent the equations, I have shown here a figure um, that consists of three subfigures. So in part A, you see um, the general model that's considered for the Earth. So in this gray area, we have the mantle. Below it, we have the fluid outer core, and below it, we have the solid inner core. In the equilibrium state, the rotation uh, or the symmetry axis of the mantle is aligned with the rotation axis. Now. If we have a tilted inner core, the symmetry vector of this um, inner core, which is represented as uh, E hat 3 prime, um, is not aligned with the symmetry axis of the mantle. And this causes the rotation axis to change. And this is not aligned with the rotation rate of the mantle. In the most comprehensive case in the panel C, if we also consider the effect of fluid outer core, we also have uh, the torques that are generated here. Um, then the rotation ac uh, axis would be further deviated uh, from the equilibrium state. So the general approach is based on a system of four coupled equations that are taken from the general theory of nutation. So the first one is from Euler equation for the angular momentum of the whole Earth. The second one is for the angular momentum balance for the uh, fluid outer core, which should be balanced with the torque that's uh, generated at CMB and also ICB. These are represented as minus because by con convention, uh, we consider the torque at ICB to be positive. So in order to be imbalanced, this should be negative. What is just a convention? We also have the angular momentum balance for the solid inner core. In terms of the torque at core, inner core boundary, this is mainly due to uh, electromagnetic torque because it's uh, at, at inner core boundary, we have a very strong magnetic field. We also have the um, gravitational torque due to the uh, uh, tilt of the inner core and the tilt of the inner core itself is uh, represented as this equation. Uh, the formulation is based on Dombrey and Bloxham. 
2002 and Dumber 2008. Elastic deformations are taken into account and also the inner core wobble is taken into account. Because the four different uh, coupled equations that I showed uh, have some uh, eigenmodes and those are uh, several. For example, we have the Chandler wobble, we have the inner core wobble, we have the spin over mode that's connected to uh, free core nutation and etc. But here we mainly consider the inner core wobble. We have four different uh, coupled equations. Uh, the first two are the usual Liouville equation, but the right hand side consists of the inner core tilt plus the torque at CMB. We also have two equations for the uh, uh, tilt of the inner core, and it involves uh, two constants, PS and QS. PS and QS are themselves um, defined based on the period of the inner core bubble and the quality factor of the inner core bubble. Um, yeah. And the KSI, KSI is the uh, involves all the terms that can, that are connected to elasticity formation, and it has a value uh, of around one times ten to the minus six. So we define two neural networks to learn the tilt of the inner core M1 and M10. Two neural networks to learn the excitation. Two neural networks uh, to learn the excitation at ICB. So we have also a um, period of the inner core and quality factor of the inner core are two additional parameters that are learned by our algorithm. And the last function of the core dynamics uh, is defined as those uh, four uh, differential equations. Uh, we also have the seismic processes that are computed based on dislocation and macro theories. So we have the observations of um, changes in the uh, moment tensors uh, from global uh, centroid moment tensor, which involves more than 67,000 events. Then we compute the excitations. From the excitations, we compute the cumulative excitations, which involves the effect of all earthquakes, denoted by delta XPE and delta YPE, and the amplitude of this change, denoted by delta E. So basically, we require the latitude, call, uh, or co-latitude, longitude, and depth of the earthquake, and then the moment tensor, then we define the specific fault functions based on this. We also take the shear modulus, Lamé parameters, and Bart modulus from uh, Earth models such as uh, preliminary reference Earth model and also seismic love numbers. Then we compute the Stokes coefficient due to uh, the effect of earthquake from moment tensor M and then angular momentum change and from that excitation and from excitation polar motion. Here I have shown an example of the earthquakes, all the earthquakes since uh, 1976. I have uh, highlighted some large earthquakes uh, with bigger uh, circles. You see some distinctive patterns, most of them happen at uh, plate boundaries, we also have interplate uh, earthquakes. Uh, we have, for example, um, Sumatra earthquake, uh, yeah, and other well known earthquakes. Uh, also, Tuoko, others. And from this, we can compute the cumulative excitation and from that, polar motion. Um, so two neural networks, M15 and M16, learn the cumulative excitations. And these are defined based on two terms for loss function. And then uh, these are connected to polar motion through the Liouville equation. And these two terms uh, define those.
So basically, this was a very short discussion on geophysical influences of polar motion and so on, and just um, presenting the results. So first result is the contribution of individual processes to polar motion. I have represented this in two panels, A and B, one for XP and one for YP. So the observed polar motion is uh, shown in the uh, blue. And uh, then the barystatic one is shown in green together with this un uncertainty. Then we also have the GIA and MC in terms of a secular trend. Um, seismic process is very small. We also have uh, we, are, we also have derived uh, uh, the core con contribution to polar motion. This uh, represents multi-decadal variation as well as a very small uh, secular trend. The situation is uh, a little bit different in YP because most of the signal is dominated by uh, the secular trend, which mainly comes from GIN and MC. The contribution of the core dynamics is smaller, and still we have, uh, aside from the secular trend, the main contribution comes from the varsity processes. Again, the seismic processes are very small. So if we add all of these together, we would closely match the uh, observed values. We should keep in mind that we are training based on 1976 up to the end of 2018, and these are the predictions. The no polar motion observation is used to uh, derive the results. And uh, yeah, so this means that we can reconstruct the polar motion based on the individual processes. So the multi decadal, uh, or maybe interannual and quasi decadal, or even multi decadal fluctuations. The primary cause is uh, barycetic processes. The secondary influence comes from core. And the primary effect of uh, uh, secular trend is from GIM mantle convection. And the secondary is from core dynamics uh, plus a very small form for aesthetic. Then we also can analyze the influence of various uh, contributors to polar motion. Body static shown as body, GIA mantle convection shown as GIA, uh, core dynamics shown as CD, and EQ uh, earthquake shown as EQ. So we have different combination of uh, processes. So for example, we can say if we include all the processes GIA, body static, earthquake, and uh, core dynamics we see very good match or um, good reconstruction because this number represents the overall RMSE, the overall difference between um, components of polar motion and observed components of polar motion and predicted ones. And for example, if we incorporate only the effect of earthquake, the RMSE is very large. Basically, we, can, we can't reconstruct them. If we insert only core dynamics, it's slightly better, but it's still too large. And it goes on and on. And we can see if we insert um, barystatic per se, uh, the uh, fit is good, but still, we require other effects to be included so that we can match the observed polar motion as well as we want. Uh, then we see that the body study processes per se is the most important one and we can further um, uh, decompose that into individual components uh, from green ice sheet, global glaciers, terrestrial water storage and also um, yeah, Antarctica is uh, Mainly the effect of uh, when we insert all of the uh, uh, barystatic processes is of course the same as this most comprehensive case because here we are 
inserting all the other uh, geophysical processes, but we are uh, decomposing biostatic processes into individual components. And we see that mainly if we want to fit to the oscillations, the stereo water storage should be present. And this comes, uh, brings me to some basic discussions. So oscillations are mostly connected to terrestrial water storage. We also have the so-called Markowitz bubble. And there has been doubt uh, whether it is a real feature of the polar motion, but it turns out that based on the independent observations and reconstructions of uh, physics in foam grounded pores, we can reconstruct um, the Markowitz bubble. And it is mainly caused by, by a combination of biostatic processes and core processes. Um, and there is a systematic anti-correlation between core and biostatic processes. I come back to this uh, in a few minutes, but uh, I should also mention the secular trend is mainly connected to mantle dynamics, namely the effect of GIR mantle convection. And seismic processes are of little influence to uh, line trade polar motion, as the reconstructions of physics informed neural networks suggest. Some findings of uh, pins. If we want to separate uh, the effect of GIR and MC, we need to have some retrieve rates of uh, true polar wonder from subduction history and backward advecting of density anomalies in the mantle. So here I am showing the results uh, uh, that I have taken. Uh, I have taken the data from uh, the previous study by my co-author. These are basically represent the direction and the rates of the mantle convection. And these are based on uh, yeah, true polar wonder based on the um, age of the uh, subduction history. Either it can be 10 million years, 2 million years, 1 million years, or uh, 0 0.01 uh, yeah, uh, million years. So this represents 305 uh, possible scenarios. What I do is to try to um, actually force the forcing elements of the uh, mantle convection to match those uh, data from subduction history and back, uh, backward advecting density anomalies. And then we can uh, separate the effect of mantle convection and GIA to a first degree. Of course, it still depends on the mantle viscosity, uh, but uh, in our experiment for, uh, uh, yeah, for an acceptable range of uh, uh, vis uh, mantle viscosity, we, we see that we can satisfactorily uh, separate the effect of GIR and MC. But if the um, mantle viscosity changes, then um, the results would quickly then diverge, and we can't uh, uh, yeah, separate these two unambiguously. I have also mentioned this um, so rates and uh, direction of JNMC separately. And the rate that we drive from the physics informed neural networks is in agreement with the geoid rate of change uh, yeah, in terms of millimeter per year. So uh, we can drive from the Maculoff theory, uh, the change in the uh, secular tiny polar motion from a geoid rate of change and this matches the uh, reconstruction of the rate and um, trend that's derived from physics informed neural networks. Um, the second finding uh, is related to uh, core dynamics. We derive an uh, inner core bubble of around 7.8 spheres and quality factor of around 90. And we derive also excitations at CMB and ICB. If I show it here, for example, excitation at uh, CMB and excitation at ICB, uh, we see there is a seemingly 
secular trend in this, which would induce a, a small secular trend into polar motion. And this is mainly due to topographic coupling between fluid outer core and mantle because uh, core mantle boundary is somewhat bumpy, has some topography on it. And then since the earth is rotating, the fluid would act on this uh, topography and would generate some um, perturbations that would uh, yeah, cascade to larger uh, perturbations, which would uh, induce some uh, perturbations into the inertia tensor of the Earth and therefore insert polar motion. But uh, for inner core boundary, it's mainly due to um, yeah, the effect of um, uh, uh, electromagnetic torque. And these are uh, the values that, uh, that are derived for the first time. We don't have a, an independent estimate so that we can um, compare with those, but this can serve a, as a basis for future studies. Uh, also, we can compute or derive the equatorial components of the tilt of the inner core. And it involves uh, uh, variations on very long time scales, probably centennial or even millennial. So on a very short time scale, uh, we can even consider it to be, uh, yeah, uh, constant. Now, the another part is the analysis of interactions. We use the perturbation approach and we, we derive most important connection between barystatic and core processes. Uh, it's between six and 8%, which means there is for each 100 milliard second perturbation in barystatic processes, there would be around six milliard second perturbation in the uh, core processes. But the exact mechanism is unknown, but it suggests that uh, processes deep within the earth are probably connected to uh, processes that act on the Earth's surface uh, to a very limit or very a small degree. It's mainly probably connected to pole tide, but we need to investigate this further. As of now, I don't know uh, or I can't provide the exact mechanism. And the concluding remarks. PINs emerge as an approach to analyze the geophysical uh, time series. Uh, we analyze the contribution of each individual uh, process uh, to the phenomenon under consideration. And we quantify the reconstruction uncertainty. And we can also analyze the correlation and causation between geophysical processes. Um, yeah. When pins are applied to long period polar motion, we see that oscillations, in, um, namely interannual and quasi decadal, are, are primarily caused by polystatic processes. Secular trend, mainly caused by GIM and convection. Uh, there is a minor contribution of um, uh, seismic processes. And we also have a small contribution of uh, core processes to both the secular trend and quasi decadal oscillations. But this act as uh, secondary compared to barycelic processes. And there is a small dynamic link between core and barycelic processes. The mechanism is still unknown uh, and it needs to be analyzed further. One thing that I didn't mention is uh, uh, the recovery of underlying physics in simulations. Because for polar motion, uh, we have the observations and we can uh, reconstruct the polar motion based on geophysical processes. But one might argue that uh, this reconstruction is not unique. A different combination of geophysical processes would uh, also explain polar motion. But uh, we did a large number of simulations and in all of those, uh, we could basically uniquely um, 
separate the effect of geophysical processes. But again, uh, uh, I should say that uh, it can't be proven definitively that uh, this is the exact uh, uh, yeah separation between or the um, uh, the composition of uh, polar motion to its um, individual underlying uh, geophysical processes. And um, the results are published in a journal Nature Geoscience, and it's called the Contributions of Coal, Mantle, and Kalamatological Processes. And you can uh, have a look. Also, uh, basically, I study the uh, uh, the supplementary material because it contains a large uh, uh, amount of information on polar motion. Thank you very much. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Mustafa, for your nice presentation. I should also appreciate the time and effort uh, you put into sharing your latest achievements with us. I believe it was a great contribution to our understanding of polar motion.